Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Welcome to episode 25 of Simpler Bible. Today we are in Exodus 4, and we've got quite a bit to cover, so let's dive in. Verse 1, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me. Remember, he's still at the burning bush, still talking to the angel of the Lord. They will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. I do love, by the way, that this part's included in here. Moses ran from it uh, because I do think that that would probably be most of your responses as well. I, I like snakes, but you know, you see a snake when you're not supposed to see a snake and you're still probably going to be a little bit frightened. Verse four, but the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it by the tail and it became a staff in his hand again. This is so that they may believe that the Lord your God, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was leprous like snow. Leprosy, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, this word is just kind of a generic word, meaning some sort of infection or skin disease. All right. Could it be leprosy? It could be leprosy. We don't know. It's just a generic word that we have translated as leprous. Verse 7. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some of the water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, very interesting, listen to this. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, a couple of things. Different translations render it slightly different ways. Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent now or in the past when you, uh, when you first spoke to your servant. But here's the idea. A lot of us were taught that this burning bush moment was the very first time God had ever spoken to Moses, that he had ever said anything to Moses. And if that's the case, when he says, I'm not eloquent now or since you first spoke to me, Basically, that would mean I'm not eloquent now or five minutes ago when the bush set on fire and you first spoke to me. That, that's kind of weird, right? But remember what we learned in the book of Hebrews, sorry, in the book of Acts. When he killed the Egyptian, the Bible says in the book of Acts, he supposed that the people of God would know that God had sent him to save them. There is something that Moses already knows about God's intent and purpose for his life. So this is likely not the first time that God has spoken to him. And so Moses is saying, look, I'm not great at speaking, not now, nor since you first spoke to me, which probably would have been 40 years earlier when he first killed the Egyptian and knew that God had sent him to be the deliverer. Uh, it just reads really funny if it was just five minutes ago in the beginning of chapter three. And so... We have to think not just of Exodus 3 and 4 here, but also of Acts 7 and Hebrews 11. And so verse 11 is a key verse. It is a difficult verse for many people. But verse 11, then God said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Let's just touch on this really quickly. So Moses says, I'm not great at talking. And God goes, well, who's the one that makes man's mouth? Who's the one that makes man mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And so we trust, we trust God, the creator. I always read this text and think automatically of John chapter nine. And in John chapter nine, we meet a man who has been born blind and the disciples kind of following along with some bad teaching of the Pharisees ask Jesus in John nine, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus' answer to them is, neither this man nor his parents sinned that he was born blind, but he was born blind that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus encounters this man, heals this man, and by the end of John chapter 9, this man has put his faith in Jesus. We even see like in John 11, where Jesus speaks of the sickness of Lazarus and how Lazarus is going to die, and that this Death won't result in death, but it, it will be for the glory of God. So God allows Lazarus to die so that God can be glorified. And so there is something in this that I just, I hope that we can remember that, that God works all things for his glory. And, and even Moses' uh, inability to speak well, he works for his glory. You'll notice that 
in every one of these, these videos, these podcasts, that I stumble over my words, I twist up my words, I mess up my words, and we are not going back and re-recording them and fixing them. It, like, it's just how I talk. And so I'm a mess, and Moses clearly was a mess as well. And God says, look, I'm the one who makes your mouth. It'll be okay. I'm sure we can handle it. Verse 12. Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak, which is a beautiful encouragement. Moses is like, man, I don't speak very well. God goes, I'm the one that created the mouth. I'll be with your mouth. I will tell you what to speak. Verse 13. Oh, my Lord, Moses says, please send someone else. Verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. This is a story we're not told in the Bible. Uh, we are not given Aaron's perspective of this. Aaron is on his way to find Moses. Why is Aaron coming to find Moses? We can't speculate. I suppose that's the wrong way to say that. We can totally speculate, but it's not beneficial because the text does not give us enough information as to why Aaron is coming out to look for Moses. It's been 40 years for crying out loud. Aaron, you're going to find out later, is Moses' older brother by three years. Aaron was not in danger of being cast into the Nile. Moses was in danger, but now Moses is the person whom God is going to use to rescue these people. And Aaron is on his way to find his brother Moses. And I love, I love God's response here. He's like, isn't Aaron your brother a Levite? Can't he speak well? Look, we'll let Aaron do the talking. And so Moses is complaining, I don't speak well. The Lord's like, don't worry, I'll tell you what to say. And he's like, no, just use somebody else. And he goes, fine, your brother Aaron's on his way. He speaks well, we'll use him. Verse 15, you shall speak to Aaron and put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be to him as God. It says in another place, we'll see it in a couple of days, that, that Moses is, is like the voice of God to Aaron and Aaron is like the prophet to the people. All right. So he says in verse 17, and take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. So Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether or not they are still alive. Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord God said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. I have a confession to make. And this is going to be now for posterity here. Every single time I read about Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, every single time, I do not know why, but the picture in my head is Uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazards, and or the Dukes of Hazard. And so now you are cursed to to think of that too if you grew up with that show. So in my head, for whatever reason, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, always in my head is pictured like uh, Uncle Jesse, even in the overalls. I, I don't believe he wore overalls at all here, but that's the picture that's in my head, and now it's in yours. Verse 19, the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons. He has two sons. We've only been introduced to one of them so far. And he had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Let's come back to that. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God, Israel is my firstborn son. And I will say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So a couple of things that we want to look at here. Verse 21, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Two words, two different words are going to be used for the term harden in the rest of Exodus. So one of them, is to make heavy. One of the words that is translated harden is to make heavy. And one of them is to strengthen. And I'm going to run out of room here, but I'm going to squeeze it in. So to strengthen, and that is definitely not how you spell strengthen because I left out the G, but we're going to go with it anyway. There we go. There's a G now. So these two words, to make heavy and to strengthen, it would be beautiful because what we're going to find in the book of Exodus is that there are times that Pharaoh hardens his heart against the will of God, and there are times that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And it would be beautiful if these two different words were used, one by Pharaoh and one by God. But there's a little bit of a mingling here. So one of the things that I want you to note is most of the time, not all of the time, unfortunately, but most of the time when it talks about Pharaoh making his heart hard, it's this word that's used heavy. Pharaoh made his heart heavy. 
And that's kind of the idea of he set his heart against God. He made his heart heavy against God. He didn't, he wasn't interested in the things of God. And most of the time when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's he strengthened his heart. So let's put it this way. Pharaoh made his heart heavy against the Lord and God strengthened that position. So Pharaoh hardens his heart and God goes, okay, I can use that. And this is kind of a picture we see throughout the Bible. In fact, we'll get into it eventually when we go through the book of 1 Thessalonians towards the very end of the year. But in, in sorry, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, we see that there will be people who are handed over to believe a deception, to believe a lie. They'll believe the lie of the Antichrist. They will disbelieve in God. And the Bible says, and God will hand them over further to that delusion. Or you think of the people who crucified Christ. They said, we're going to kill this guy. We're going to put him to death. And... God used that to have Jesus put to death so that salvation could be brought about. And so God is, is taking the heaviness of Pharaoh's heart, the heart of Pharaoh that is against him, and he is strengthening Pharaoh's resolve to be against God so that God can accomplish his purpose through Pharaoh. And you'll notice this in verse 22 and 23, which we won't see this again until chapter 11. But it says, Say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. So the last of the 10 plagues that Moses is going to uh, perform over the Egyptian household, the last of the 10 plagues is the plague of the death of the firstborn. It's where the Passover happens. And God, even before Moses, even before Moses comes face to face with Pharaoh, even before he stands before Pharaoh, Moses has already been told by God, tell Pharaoh to let my firstborn son, to let Israel go. And if you don't let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. So here already is a prediction of what's going to happen in chapter 11. Verse 24, these next three verses, I have no idea what they mean. I don't. I will occasionally have people call me, text me, and they will say, hey, I have a question about Exodus 4. And automatically I say, I have no idea because I already know what the question is going to be. I wish I knew you who are smarter than me, respond to this video, send us a message, let us know what we're missing here. All right. Verse 24 says this, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So God left him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. So they're traveling back to Egypt. God has met with Moses, said, I need you to go back. I need you to rescue my people. I need you to be my voice of deliverance to the people. I need you to speak to Pharaoh. I need you to speak to the elders of the land. You and Aaron partner together, redeem my people from slavery. And on his way, God goes, you know what? I'm going to put Moses to death because his sons aren't circumcised. And Zipporah, his wife, who's a foreigner, circumcises their sons and, and says, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. And that is all we're told. That is all we're told about it. I, I don't know what to make of this. Um, I, I don't know what to understand about this. The, the practice of circumcision had fallen off in Egypt. That's a funny way to say that if you think about the fact that we're talking about circumcision, but never mind. We won't dwell on that. And so the practice of circumcision hadn't been happening for a while. So why is God angry? Remember, remember what God had said all the way back when he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. He said to him, any of your men who are not circumcised, I will cut off from my people. And, and so there's something about this that because Moses has been speaking with God, there's something about this that there should have been the expectation for Moses who has encountered God to circumcise his sons. He doesn't circumcise his sons and now there's going to be judgment and his wife is the one who rescues him from that. But beyond that, I don't know what this three verse story is really about. Verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. So that's the only part of this story that we're told is that God's the one who told Aaron to go. Verse 28, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did all the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Keep that in mind. That attitude 
is not going to last very long. In fact, in the next chapter, they're already going to be done with it. So they're excited. They're relieved. They're glad to hear that God has seen their oppression. They're glad to know that God has seen them and that he's visiting them and he's about to redeem them. And they're going to bow their heads and they're going to worship him basically until tomorrow. But we will talk about that next time. Thank you so much for joining with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.